Good morning, everyone. And I guess it's actually one minute past morning. So good afternoon as well. Um, I am Assistant Dean Andrew Janice Elmore at the Rosenstiel School of Marine, Atmospheric, and Earth Science uh, here at the University of Miami. And it is a very nice day here. So I am glad you're all able to join us. I wish you could join us in person, but we're glad you're able to join us virtually. Uh, I would like to just quickly cover um, some of what this webinar will be. It's not going to be very long, and um, we're going to essentially give you an opportunity to learn more about our application process, about what our departments do, and the kind of general research that they engage in, and our different degree programs. Uh, during the webinar, we're going to have the opportunity to drop questions in the Q&A, However, we're going to save most of our answers to the Q&A um, for the end of the webinar. So kind of around the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, additionally, when we are having the departments and um, programs speak, we're going to have them uh, answer questions briefly during that time. Otherwise, we would like you just to save your questions um, for the end of the webinar. Heidi, did you raise your hand? So, nope, we're all good. Okay, good. Just making sure. Um, in that case, I'll just say um, for the agenda, we're going to have me talk a little bit generally about the school for a few minutes now. And then we're going to have one of our um, wonderful master professional science students, Ariana Trapp, talk about student resources on campus, um, mostly for prospective students. So tours and um, info sessions and some of our facilities. And then we're going to have one of our uh, master of science students, Remedy Rule, talk about uh, our various graduate student and other student organizations. And then around 1225, we'll be going through our different departments and programs. And we'll end it with our undergraduate programs in addition to our five departments and our MPS degree. Uh, and then we'll end with the Q&A. So just to give you kind of a quick overview of what we are as a school, let me see what I can do here. Um, so the Rosensteel School was originally the University of Miami's Marine Research Station. It was located in a different spot, but in the 1940s, um, we were founded, we moved here, uh, and we started off as a specifically marine science institution, but we gradually added departments in atmospheric sciences, as well as marine geosciences and earth science. Um, and so we're very broadly about all of the natural sciences now. Um, and I would say that we are one of the top institutions for studying earth science in the United States. Um, we offer four kinds of degrees, and we'll cover a little bit of each of them today. Um, the first kind is our undergraduate degrees, which mostly take place on the main campus, but have some elements on our marine campus. And then we have our Master of Science degree. The Master of Science is actually our smallest program, and you'll perhaps understand a little more why later, um, but it is a good program. And we have our Master of Professional Science, which is slightly different from the MS. I'll cover how in just a moment. And we have our PhD program, which is a really great fully funded PhD program. Um, so for our undergraduate, we have a lot of undergraduate majors. Our largest one is uh, marine biology and ecology, but we have wonderful programs in marine affairs, geological sciences, meteorology, oceanography, and basically any other kind of science about the natural world that you could think of. We also offer uh, four undergraduate minors and those can be added on to other degrees if you're not feeling like you want to do a whole major or if you want to do two, a major and a minor in our uh, school as well. Uh, a couple of things that I just wanted to quickly mention for undergraduate, but maybe mentioned more later. Uh, undergraduates get an opportunity to participate in saltwater semester. And this is a really wonderful program that we have where undergraduates come to our campus and over the course of one semester, they do hands-on research experiences, even though they are undergrads in different laboratories. And they kind of cycle through different laboratories, getting almost a tasting menu of what the different uh, labs do and how to do research in them. So it is a really great program. And it's one that 
our undergrads now have access to. So they get a lot of lab and research experience in addition to just taking classes. Um, we also have a U Galapagos program where our undergraduates get to go abroad uh, to the Galapagos and stay with a host family for a semester. Uh, the Master Professional Science program also has a program that is studying abroad in the Galapagos that is slightly, slightly shorter and structured a little bit differently, but we have a very strong relationship with the Galapagos, which is a wonderful place to do research and study. Our PhD and MS programs are divided up um, into both departmental programs and kind of cross-departmental programs, but the largest ones are the ones within our departments. So our departments are atmospheric sciences, environmental science and policy, marine biology and ecology, marine geosciences, and ocean sciences. But we also have others in ocean engineering, data science, climate and health, meteorology, and physical oceanography. So a lot of very broad offerings in the PhD and MS. Um, we also offer... Uh, sorry, the Master of Professional Science degree. So the Master of Professional Science degree is slightly different from a traditional MS, but not in terms of the classes or the rigor. In terms of classes and rigor, it is very much the same. You take the same kinds of courses that you would take as a PhD student or an MS student. They're all the same classes for everybody. Um, what classes you are in may depend upon your degree and what your um, track is, but it is innovative in the sense that instead of writing a research thesis and taking two to three years to complete, the MPS degree can be completed in as little as one year, taking nine months of classes and three months of internship, to, for I, most people, I would say, complete in about a year and a semester, so like 15 months or so. And the uh, internship project is very broadly defined. It can be an internship in an office. It can be an internship in a laboratory doing research. It can be an internship with a large government research institution like NASA or NOAA, or it could be doing field work or work outside with the National Park Service or one of our labs doing field work, anything like that. Um, so it's a very broad degree. It offers advanced training and we have 14 different tracks that have had very good um, record, a very good record of placement within the career um, field of the student that wants to do the master's degree. So we'll have more talk on the master's degree in a bit, but I just briefly wanted to mention it. Um, it offers 14 tracks. Um, I won't go through them all right now, but I'll briefly put them up for you to have a look at. Um, as you can see, very, very broad options. When you apply, uh, you're able to apply for more than one if you can't decide. So you can apply for up to two. And I'll talk a little more about the application process uh, in just a moment here. As far as requirements for both the PhD and the MPS and the MS, I would suggest that you look on our website and look at whatever programs you're interested in, because they will definitely have a list of what their prerequisites are, and prerequisites vary a lot depending on which department you're applying to, which program you're applying to, etc. So for the MPS, you can have full or part-time enrollment. Full-time enrollment can involve like two semesters, in classes and then a three to six month internship. Other people might take nine credits and so that can extend their classes to one more semester if they want a more leisurely pace. But you can talk to me more if you have questions about that. Um, the prerequisites can vary a lot. As you can see for marine biology and ecology tracks, there are some very specific course requirements as an undergraduate. I would mention that even if as an undergrad you want to apply for marine biology and ecology, but let's say you're lacking one semester of calculus, um, you may be able to make up for that with other um, kinds of classes you have taken or experiences you have had. So don't automatically write it off if you're missing one of the prerequisites. Reach out to me and we can have a conversation about whether you might have some other qualities that could be worthwhile to play up in your application. Um, for environmental science and policy, this is a very broad one that deals a lot with policy. So it has actually very simple course requirements in terms of definite prerequisites. You just need a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts degree. It can be in any relevant field to whatever you're applying for. Um, as you can see, there are more here for atmospheric sciences and ocean sciences that are a vary between for broadcast meteorology, it's quite open. And for applied remote sensing, it's quite specific. So again, on our website, you can definitely go ahead and look into whichever tracks you want, but check out the prerequisites for each one. That can be helpful in figuring out what would be a good fit for yourself.
So if I go back here, I just briefly wanted to mention some of our MPS alums. Um, Madeline Miller in Coastal Zone Management has gone on to found and be the CEO of a uh, textile recycling company. Uh, another example, Michael McVeigh uh, was in our fisheries management and conservation, and he's now a habitat restoration biologist. And um, our last one was in our climate and society track and is now a physical scientist for the EPA. So a lot of very broad career trajectories. It has been a really great um, program, and it is our largest graduate program and most popular for a number of reasons. But that is not to say our other graduate programs are not excellent, rigorous, and totally worth applying for. The good news is you can actually apply for them all on one degree, uh, sorry, on one application. So um, for application information, uh, the deadlines, January 4th is the PhD and MS deadline, and you'll hear back in March or May. The MPS application we structure differently because it's different committees. They are smaller and they are able to process these applications more quickly. So for the MPS, you can apply anytime from now until June 1st, and you'll hear back within four to six weeks, and you can apply for a first or second choice track. For the PhD, MS, and MPS, the GRV is not required. And as I said, on one application, you can apply for all of them. The PhD, you can mark that you also wanna be considered for MS and MPS. And I strongly encourage you to do this because unlike many schools, we will not care or ding you for one application if you've also applied to another. All of our faculty and our application committees know that this is how we operate and no one will mind if you're applying for multiple things. Um, to apply, you can just go to our website uh, and you'll see apply now. I'd encourage you to have a look. For financing your education, I'm running a little low on time, but I will say PhD students get a full five years of support that is guaranteed and cannot be taken away. It's pre-funded. The MPS degree is generally self-funded, but we have a few uh, kinds of funding opportunities in that you'll automatically be considered for a 10 to 20% tuition discount based on your GPA. Um, and there's also the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award, which can cover up to the rest of your cost of tuition, 80%. Uh, the MS degree is self-funded and does not really usually come with many funding opportunities. There's more information about this on our website. Um, and I would just mention that you can follow us on social media as well if you'd like to learn more about our research. Uh, finally, I'll let um, our next speaker, Ariana, talk about our tours and information session, but I would mention that these virtual information sessions, you can see at the bottom of my slide, they're a really, really good way to prepare for applying and to clear up any questions you might have. So I encourage you to sign up for those sessions if you are interested in applying. Um, thank you. And I will go ahead and say that um, if you have any questions, I am very, very happy to talk to you. So feel free to send me an email. Um, I have a texting number that you can um, call. That's not the texting number. That's actually my office phone, but you can try to leave a message there and I'll get back to you. Uh, and you can also, the final one is my Calendly, where you can set up a virtual information session with me. Um, on our website, you can also set up virtual information sessions with current and former students, which I encourage as well. Um, all right. I think that is all I have to say for now. So I will turn it over to Ariana Trapp, one of our amazing MPS students, who's going to share more about um, a number of things. Here you go. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Thanks for joining. I am going to share my screen because I have a short presentation. So um, yeah, like Andrew said, my name is Ariana Trapp. I'm an MPS student here at the Rosensteel School on the Marine Conservation Track. So if you mentioned all those tracks, I'm on the Marine Conservation Track. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, prospective student resources, information sessions, and those tours that Andrew briefly touched on as well. So for our tours, we have in-person and virtual tours. The in-person tours are guided of the Rose Steel campus, and they're available Monday through Friday at 2.30 p.m., um, and those are by appointment only, so you can register in advance on our website, and I believe a link will be put in the chat as well if you'd like to go ahead and do that. Um, and then virtual tours are available as well for both undergraduate and graduate programs. 
And those, you can just go to the website and find the link to those virtual tours. We also have virtual information sessions. So like Andrew mentioned, um, you can go and talk with him. So you can talk with our assistant dean. We can also um, be booked as current and former students, as well as our MPS staff can be booked for informational sessions. And then the link to that as well is in the chat, but you can book that and, and the assumption is that you come with your questions. And so if you have questions about the application process, um, program information, or just general questions, you can come with those questions ahead of time and just ask them um, through those sessions. And those are for also for graduate and undergraduate students. And then campus resources um, and facilities. So we have a lot of cool stuff on campus. Our Rosenstiel School Library is um, a really comprehensive library, but I want to just mention that the librarians are really awesome as well. So um, we have two librarians in the library that are very helpful resources as far as like research, writing, um, and everything that you may need on campus. They're really useful. We also have two MPS student lounges. So those are only available to the MPS students, and they have coffee machines, they have microwaves, fridge, they have lockers in there. If you're coming to school with everything in your whole life, you can put stuff in the locker. Um, and we also have couches and chairs and whiteboards. So it's a really good like group study environment or individual study environment as well in there, um, or just a good place to put your things throughout the day. Also, we have our MTLSS building, which is the Marine Technology, Life Sciences, and Seawater Research Building. It's our newest building on campus, and it has um, a lot of our labs in that building, including our Sustain Lab, which is our hurricane simulator. So our hurricane simulator is the only one in the world that can actually um, simulate Category 5 hurricanes. So that's pretty awesome and very unique to our campus. We also have several different labs. Um, we have our coral labs, the Nidarian Immunity Lab, we have a toadfish lab if you're into toadfish or just fish in general. Um, and then we have an aplesia lab as well. And then also in this picture here, you can see two more of our facilities. We have our splash dive training facility, which is that pool on the left. That is our dive training pool. So we have a um, scientific diving course and a free diving course available to our graduate students. And those are held largely in that pool. It's 15 feet deep. There's no shallow end um, and it is fully fresh water. And then also in this picture, you can see our research vessel, the Walton Smith, and that is a 96 foot long research vessel. And it takes cruises ranging between like one day and maybe up to two weeks. So um, the ranges for that vary and there are opportunities for students to get involved um, with the labs on that research vessel as well. So other um, research and volunteer opportunities for both undergraduate and graduate students um, include our coral nursery. So if you just really love coral, we have a lot of different coral labs, like I mentioned, but we also have a coral nursery as well that you can volunteer and research with. Um, and then we have our um, research station at Broad Key, which is just a 45 minute boat ride from campus. Um, and there's 20, there's housing available for up to 20 people. So if you're doing something more long-term, um, you can just stay there, at, stay there for um, whatever your research needs are. And then we have an experimental fish hatchery, which is um, an aquaculture lab, which is actually across the street from the main campus of Rose and Steel. I mean, that's a really large um, lab. So there's always opportunities for research and volunteer over there. We also have a, a atmospheric chemistry observatory over in Barbados and study abroad um, and research abroad opportunities in Galapagos that um, Dr. Elmore did mention as well. And then we have our shark research and conservation program as well as marine mammal science programs. So if you're into those big and charismatic animals such as sharks and dolphins and whales and things like that, we have opportunities for research and um, volunteering with those programs. And then lastly, I wanted to mention that we do have um, two NOAA facilities nearby. They are not necessarily super affiliated with student programming on campus, but there are um, opportunities, especially for the MPS program, there are opp opportunities to get involved on those um, campuses. So if you have any questions about anything that I mentioned, I will be back for the Q&A session after this, but thanks for having me all, and I hope I get some questions later. Thank you so much, Ariana. Uh, we will now pass it along to uh, Dr. Igor Kamenkovich, who's going to talk about our ocean uh, sciences program. Uh, 
Um, yes, hello. Uh, my video is still not enabled. I think. Mm -hmm. Can I share my screen now? Yes, you should be able to. Okay, thank you. Yes, hello, my name is Igor Kaminkovich. I am a chair of the Department of Ocean Sciences. I was asked to talk about my department, the research and educational uh, education opportunities in the department. So um, uh, this is probably the most interdisciplinary department in the school. It brings together um, people studying biological, chemical, and physical oceanography. The mission of the department to, to get the most holistic view of the ocean using the research and education. And this mission has never been more important at this time when we face multiple challenges from climate change, uh, environmental pollution, and others. So uh, I'm, I want to write uh, to run this quick video that will give an overview of research in our department. Our mission is to study the ocean using all available means. This is a look at our most advanced um, lab facility, observational programs, and people take measurements in the sea. Um, and then I will go over some of these points in a little bit more detail. Of the important component of research in our departments is observations. And for that purpose, we use a range of uh, techniques. Uh, starting from in situ measurements, when you actually go to the ocean and make measurements there, sometimes it means you work in pretty rough conditions. So so-called remote sensing, when you uh, collect data remotely using uh, advanced technologies. Uh, we use one of the most advanced uh, lab facilities uh, at the university. Here's a picture of the wave tank it's one of the most advanced facility that uh, can uh, can generate hurricane strength winds in a lab environment and uh, study the effects of these winds on the ocean surface and coastal areas uh, we have multiple uh, laboratories including uh, biogeochemical laboratories with advanced instrumentations and students both graduates and undergraduates work in these laboratories, gaining experience and earning their degrees. And, uh, and finally, many, uh, many of us use numerical simulations in their research. Uh, students are also involved in this kind of research, which uh, requires some qualitative skills and programming skills. As you know, numerical simulations are the only way to look into the future, and, and looking into the future is important for climate and regional forecasts. A little bit more on the educational program, uh, our philosophy, the philosophy of the entire school is to provide a unique blend of research and education. So research informs education and uh, vice versa. So just a quick look at some of the educational programs associated with our department. I will start from Master of Science in Ocean Engineering, which has two tracks, remote sensing and maritime security as well as coastal engineering focused track. Uh, then we have several, uh, we have a vibrant and active uh, PhD program uh, where students are involved in research in several areas, including observations, lab analysis, numerical mod modeling, and advanced technology that we use to probe the ocean and collect necessary, necessary data. And finally, uh, uh, our department has two tracks for in um, Masters of Professional Science, MPS. These tracks are shown here. One track is in applied remote sensing, 
And the second is natural hazards and catastrophes. Uh, in the second track, uh, students learn uh, skills and knowledge necessary for employment and sectors that deal with these catastrophes, including reinsurance, uh, city planning, and so forth. Applied remote sensing will provide technical skills uh, associated with, uh, with sensing for both uh, scientific, uh, civilian, uh, and uh, in military and other uses. Right. This uh, completes my sh very short presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Kamenkovich. Um, I think that um, I'm going to keep an eye on the um, Q&A for a moment and see whether anyone has any specific questions about our ocean sciences department. Um, if they do, um, you should be able to also type an answer, I think, um, in the chat. Uh, but for the sake of time, we might go ahead and keep moving to our next presentation with Dr. Katie Mock, who is the chair of our Environmental Science and Policy Department. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamenkovich. Welcome. Okay, thank you. And I'm not able to start my video myself, so I think the host needs to start my video. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really an honor to introduce the Department of Environmental Science and Policy. In a way, you can think about our department as the department that connects all of the natural sciences happening across the Rosenseal School to society, to policy, to management. We are very much a solutions-focused department, thinking about the range of interdisciplinary social science methods relevant to understanding how people across the world perceive environmental change, climate change, the ways in which many levels and agencies of government are taking action to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases or support coral reef health. We think hard about the interactions additionally across the public and private sector and through all of the community organizations and societies that really constitute civil society writ large. Uh, it's kind of exciting in that we have been a department that's been reimagining our goal and our mission in a changing climate under coinciding environmental threats and issues. And in that way, we're thinking hard about what it means to support students in careers that span context from research institutions to community organizations, to government, uh, and also to the expanding private sector opportunities in the space of environmental science policy and management. Our faculty and our students are trained in diverse interdisciplinary applied social sciences. We have faculty who take economic angles on this research. We have faculty thinking about more of the anthropological and sociological dimensions of how a changing environment um, is experienced in communities around the world. We also have many people doing applied decision and policy analysis and law. In a way, we aren't as focused on any one specific system. Many of our students and faculty think about the high oceans, for example, fisheries management on the high seas. Others think about coastal zone management under the coinciding threats that tend to come into acute and intense focus and sometimes conflict in our coastal regions here in South Florida, um, as well as globally. And we also have people thinking about climate change from angles as diverse as climate adaptation, how we prepare and respond to the changing climate, to climate communications and the degree to which there can be very complex interactions across businesses and governments and residents. South Florida very much for us is a living lab, given the degree to which policy and management is so relevant here in our coastal zones, in terms of ocean management, uh, as well as in a changing climate under threats of flooding and heat. We support students across a number of different programs, as you've heard from many of the departments so far. Our undergraduate program is Marine Affairs, situated with environmental science and policy writ large. We also support students across a large number of MPS tracks, ranging really from marine conservation to exploration science to climate and society, just to name a few. 
Uh, we have an MS program supporting students interested in doing research masters. And we also have our Abbas PhD program in environmental science and policy. As I mentioned before, students from our programs go into diverse career contexts related to research, government management and action, uh, the increasing number of options in the business and private sector, um, as well as in community organizations. And I will close it there. Thank you, Heidi, for the reminder. Thank you so much, Dr. Mock. Um, are there any questions about the Environmental Science and Policy Department? I think we have one or two minutes. I'm just looking at the Q&A now. Um, I think one question that comes up is, are there particular prerequisites for the environmental science and policy programs, or is it fairly open? Yeah, I think the most important thing there is that, for example, for our MPS, MS, and PhD, PhD degrees, students can have relevant training across a very large number of disciplines of origin uh, in terms of their undergraduate studies, for example. So I'd say in that sense, um, we are deliberately inclusive and interdisciplinary. In a given classroom, we can have students who trained in resource management, natural sciences, policy studies, you name it. Um, so we do have kind of the basic requirements, but we are also often looking at where student interest is coming from in the admissions process. Great, thank you. Um, if you have more questions for Dr. Mock, um, let's see, I have one more question here, but I think I'll just answer it quickly because it says um, the EVR program does offer MPS. However, if you, you have to go to the MPS website to kind of select those, to look through those tracks, they're under the prerequisite section. Um, uh, someone asked whether EVR offers MPS programs, but as Dr. Mock mentioned, uh, it does offer several. Um, it's just that they're linked through the MPS specific website, mps.earth.miami.edu. Um, and with that, I will move us along. And thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mock, and um, sharing more about the Environmental Science and Policy Department. Our next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Dr. Martin Grossel from our Marine Biology and Ecology Department. Thanks, Andrew, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm a professor at the uh, Rosenstiel School, and I chair the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology, and I'm very, very delighted to be talking about what we do in Marine Biology and Ecology at the Rosenstiel School. I'm going to share my screen here, if I'm allowed. Um, All right, I hope you can all see this. So as I mentioned, I'm representing the Department of Marine Biology and Ecology. Uh, we run the largest undergraduate program on campus. Uh, currently, we have about 270 students uh, in a single major marine biology and ecology program. In addition to that, uh, we have a number of professional master master's programs. Uh, they include uh, programs in fisheries, aquaculture, marine mammal science, and tropical marine ecology. Uh, just like EVR, we have uh, an MSc program. So these are research-based master students. Uh, we have about 15 students in the program at the moment. And we also run, of course, a PhD program. And one of the unique things about marine biology and ecology at the Rosenstiel School is that we enjoy access to very diverse marine environments. And they include mangroves, uh, grass flats, coral reefs, and of course, the open ocean as well. And we have an extensive fleet of research vessels of different sizes that can access these different environments. Uh, so literally right uh, outside our door, we have we have access to um, to real marine biology. And that, that is a massive asset for education and research. And I should say education at all levels, undergraduate uh, and graduate. Uh, we offer uh, dive training. Uh, we offer boat handling courses uh, for um, students that need access to to diving, of course, as part of their work, and also access to this fleet of research vessels. 
The MBE faculty consists of a total of 26 faculty and is spread over uh, tenure track faculty, research faculty, and lecturers. And uh, they cover a wide range of soft disciplines within, bio, within uh, marine biology. So we have colleagues that work on ecology, physiology, immunology. Uh, we have colleagues that work on marine models for human health. Um, we focus a lot on coastal resilience, conservation, and this is in large extent in collaboration with EBR that you just heard about. Uh, we consider evolution, aquaculture, toxicology, and fisheries. And I think one of the unique things about our department is that not only do we work in these different sub-disciplines, but we look at a lot of the interactions between these sub-disciplines. Um, and I will say the Department of Marine Biology is, is really, really good at this. And in fact, many of our graduate students work in more than one group or more than one lab to sort of allow for um, interactions between these different sub-disciplines. And also say that we interact a lot with several of the other departments at the Rosenstiel School to do truly interdisciplinary work, which I think is uh, one of the unique features of the Rosenstiel School. We're very well positioned to do that, considering the diversity of the programs that we have on campus. Uh, our undergraduate program emphasize research intensive teaching um, and activities to a large extent. We have several study abroad programs, including at the Galapagos. Um, we have what we call a saltwater semester, which is a semester that is fully immersed in research on the marine campus. And of course, we offer a senior thesis for our undergraduate students um, that involve uh, active research in one of our groups or one of the labs on the Rosen Steel campus. And finally, um, our undergraduate program uh, qualified for both pre-med and pre-vet um, title applications. And I think I'll end there, and I'm very happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Grossell. Uh, let me have a look at these and see whether there are any questions about our marine biology and ecology program. Um, there is one question about whether marine biology and ecology students, I'm assuming MPS students, do internships with marine veterinarians. Uh, that that has happened and that does happen. It depends a little bit on what track you're in and whether uh, such an internship can, can can be identified. But yes, that has happened. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, are there options for undergraduate students to get involved with research? Yes, plenty. So I think uh, the senior thesis is 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 probably the the most clearly identified path for that. And so typically, what happens in your second or third year you would start engaging and interacting with one or more of our faculty and you will sort of slowly emerge into research, whether it's in the lab or in the field. And that would position it really nicely for a senior thesis in your final year. Uh, so yes, that does happen. And I will say it is not uncommon for undergraduate students to be involved in peer reviewed publications as, as co-authors. That, that does happen. There's no guarantee for that, but that does happen. Okay, great. There's another question in the chat that says, for the marine biology and ecology labs, are they currently accepting MS students for fall of 2024? So I cannot give a, a, a single answer to that. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing either a, a master's or a PhD in any individual group, I encourage you to apply for admission into the program. But importantly, you need to reach out to the professors that you wish to work with. So that initial contact is actually really, really important that improves your chances of getting entry into the program. So if you're interested in, say, for example, immunology, look up who is doing that in MBE and reach out to them uh, for the possibility of, of sort of an advisory role. Perfect. And then the last question is just, does the MPS program qualify for entry into the MS or PhD programs? That's a great question. So again, there's no guarantee, but yes, we do transfer students from the MPS program into the MSc program and also into the PhD program. Um, but there's several examples of that, and I think it, it's happening every year. Uh, so, so it is a way to position yourself for entry into those programs, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, I would say uh, we have one last question here. Are there any overlaps between marine biology and computer science? Uh, yes, so, and we actually offer upper level undergraduate courses and graduate courses in uh, handling of large data sets and, uh, and modeling uh, specifically along for analysis of, of larger biological data sets. So yes, there's, there's absolutely interaction and overlap there. Wonderful. 
All right, well, I think we are at time. So thank you so much for sharing more about our marine biology and ecology programs, Dr. Grossel. Uh, now we will go ahead and move along to our marine geosciences department, uh, which will be introduced by Dr. Gregor Eberly. Thank you very much. I'm Gregor Eberly. I'm working in the Marine Geoscience Department, and I give this talk on behalf of our division chairman is out at sea at, at the moment. And I share the screen and hope I can give you an overview here. So the Marine Geoscience Department, basically our mission is to undertake basic society relevant research in earth sciences. We have about 13 faculties, four lecturers and scientists, and about 30 excellent students, postgraduate and undergraduate students. We sort of concentrate in three areas. One is the modern and ancient carbonates and reefs here in South Florida. We live in a carbonate environment, and that's where we try to get the ocean and the Earth's history from the carbonate record. Then we have what is also the paleoclimatology and geochemistry portion of the division that has a big lab with all different instruments to really get the proxies for all these changes through time uh, from the sedimentary record. Our geophysicists, they concentrate a lot on volcanoes and subduction zones and the hazards from those. So looking with remote sensing on the bulging of volcanoes to predict uh, explosions or uh, eruptions, or also modeling the deep ocean crust. And I want to show you two of our faculty who does do that. The first one is Adam Holt in his group, he uses computational models to look at the plate motions and plate boundary evolution. Currently, he really concentrates on the subduction zones. He has three funded PhD students in the program and has two undergraduate um, students modeling together with him on these projects. Wo Ching Ling looks at the, is a seismologist and she looked on all tectonic seismology, volcanic seismology all around the world using of broadband seismographs, portable seismic modes to get all this information. And he has plenty of um, two funded PhDs and plenty of smaller projects for undergraduate researchers to work with her. Then within the MGS, we also have the CSL Center for Carbonate Research, where basically nearly all of our soft rock um, phys uh, faculty, scientists, and lecturers are housed. It's a good bunch of people, and we have a wi wide array of, of topics that we look at from the shallow deep carbonate system, biology or biology, geophysics, petrophysics, carbon capture and utilization storage, coming all in, all the different faculty work on these projects. And that's just one of show three of those projects that are currently underway. Oh, here, and I don't forget other students that are currently working with us here, both uh, graduate, PhD students, and undergraduates are involved in these projects. Sam Purgis has a great project over in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba, where he looks at the evolution of the rift basin and also the deep brine pools that form in these. He goes down with submersibles. You see him here in the, going down in the submersible and on the left-hand side where he sits on the seafloor, collecting samples and taking the, the carbonate precipitates and the evolution of the, the Gulf or the rift basins in the Gulf of Aqaba. Very exciting. We have also quite some work with um, with the biologists. Carbonates are formed by mostly by carbonate secreting organisms, and lately we also discovered that actually the Martin Grossella said this for many years from the marine biology department that carbonate is produced in the digestive tract of the fish, and together with Amanda Earl, that have currently a big project funded where they will make. A controlled experiments with different species of fish to look of how much they actually produce and how much that influences the carbon cycle in the world's ocean. Well, we're sitting close to the Gulf Stream and for many, many years, Erasmus has been on the forefront of looking at the oceanography, physical oceanography of the, of the Gulf Stream and the ocean currents. Well, we're at the Marine Geoscience Department, we look at the ancient record that is recorded in the big contourite rifts that you see here on the right hand side. This one is a picture from the northeast of the Great Barrier Reef on the Marion Plateau that records the evolution of the currents through time, a project that we have concentrated for many years and continue to do so. <laughs> for all this, we have also a wonderful facilities in the stable isotope laboratory and the Neptune lab that um, Ali Purma runs. But Peter Swart has probably the most 
mass spectrometers are massed in his laboratory down here in Florida and is clumping day and night with, um, with his postdocs and with his students. From the educational um, aspect, besides the PhD and master's program, we also have a certificate program, which is a half year program, mostly designed for working geoscientists that want to come back and get a more and detailed knowledge of carbonate uh, geology. And we also have an environmental MPS program in environmental, environmental geo geology. Now, the goal of the mission here is really to provide education in environmental geology to students who want to translate their passion for the environment in a, in a fulfilling career. And we show them how to analyze subsurface logs, how to image the subsurface, how to take samples from the subsurface to make a site assessment, how to interpret course. And basically by doing so, we try to give them a rigorous training so they can make a reasonable and well-educated um, guidance for people who are responsible for the development of coastal and urban areas, and also for the mitigation of naturally and anthropogenically geological hazards. That's our department. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Dr. Eberle, uh, any questions for the Department of Marine Geosciences? While we're waiting to see whether some uh, interesting questions come in, I had a quick question, which is just, what would you say some of the most interesting courses in marine geosciences are that students take? Well, I would say in the geophysics is probably the, the geophysical evolution of the, or the, um, he calls it the, plate tectonics and the magma evolution that Adam Holt teaches. Mm -hmm. And on the undergraduate levels, we have like paleoceanography that we learned as the mm -hmm. geology of the earth, the history of the earth. And from the soft rock, we probably do earth surface processes as, as the most students in the world right now. Also from mm -hmm. other MPS programs, we have students enrolled in these classes. Great. Um, I have one question that came in. Um, are there opportunities to study remotely for a Master of Marine Science or the Certificate Course in Carbonate Geology? No, this course is unlike many other environmental geology programs, MPS programs. This one is like the classes are designed that you basically have half theoretical training academic training in the classroom and the other half would be practical training like on-site to take measurements for or samples for chemical measurements that it would make seismic interpretation so it's not an online program it's actually in-house program with hands-on training and i would just add that i think that is one of our great strengths and um, the reason why people like to is to do degrees here is because you have those opportunities for hands-on uh, training and field work which are very hard to do remotely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eberly. We're gonna go ahead and move along to our next department. Um, so our next department, our last of our departments will be uh, our Atmospheric Sciences Department uh, presented by the chair, Dr. Paquita Zvidema. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Let's see, let me um, make sure I'm showing this full screen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So introducing the, uh, I, I hope you can't hear the background noise here. Um, introducing the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. So we are, um, let's see, we, so we, we have three programs, an undergraduate, a PhD program, and a master's of professional science program. Our undergraduate meteorology program is designed to be compliant with the requirements of the National Weather Service uh, cert certification so that people can go directly from the undergrad program to um, jobs that require that certification, which is besides government jobs, uh, private industry also likes uh, to see to see that kind of a background. Uh, we have four double um, major tracks with marine science, computer science, um, broadcast meteorology and mathematics. And uh, we have a very active student chapter. So this 
student chapter um, organizes trips around, you know, particularly the hurricane um, research groups around Miami and uh, goes to the annual AMS meeting um, and is, you know, active in presenting their work. And there, we also have a um, very active group with the broadcast meteorologist, Kane's Cast UMTV, that also involves people not necessarily in that track. Um, we're very successful with with finding summer internships, and um, are very proud of the fact that we have eight Noah Holling scholarship recipients in the last few years. This may not seem like a large number, but we're a small program, so we have a pretty high faculty to student ratio. We have about thirty students uh, at the moment. We're trying to get up to forty, but that that does mean that. Um, our students get a lot of individual attention. And a lot of people also participate in the, uh, in, um, the honors program and do senior theses um, with projects that are just all over the board um, in hurricanes, um, you know, climate variability, um, urban heat island, coastal sea level rise um, prediction. And we, we have an excellent program director, um, Lisa Murphy, who guides this program along. So let's see. Okay, our, our MPS program. So this is a, a accelerated master's degree with a focus on weather forecasting in particular. So we, we attract a lot of people interested in getting into the hurricane prediction field or in um, uh, more private industry applications with say energy, short-term energy forecasting or um, outreach to the public. Uh, we also have a broadcast meteorology track in that and a, a climate and society track that is looking more at, ter at issues of like urban climate resilience and, and is actually very broad cut, um, broad in its scope. It also um, links up with a, a lot of the other programs at, at Miami. Um, the curriculum is expressly structured so that people can be done in a year so that they can go out there and... and um, participate in the job market and we have been we have a very good track record oh, yeah. with job placement so these are some um oops where did that go um, let's see I'm not sure why it went back like that okay um yeah we have a very good track record with that so lastly is our um phd program Let's see, I'm gonna move this forward. Okay, here we go. Um, so we have a very active PhD program. The PhD students are financially supported through graduate research assistantships. And uh, I think you've already heard of what a nice program that is that we provide three years, the advisors provide three years of funding through their, their projects. And then the two, the school matches that with two additional years of which one year is as a teaching assistant so that you also get that exposure. Um, with our nine faculty, we have experts in hurricane science, climate variability, change at a you know, variety of scales, cloud processes and feedbacks, and atmospheric chemistry. And we, um, we use a broad range of tools from you know, modeling at all kinds of scales, but also field work and lab work um, including through a uh, field station in Barbados that is uh, has been there for quite a while that focuses on long-range aerosol transport from northern Africa. So um, we, we also have a combined meteorology physical oceanography program that takes advantage of the ocean sciences department um, being nearby and um, you know we have a very collaborative environment with with other departments as well and um, I, I think it's fair to say that our student morale is very high. So um, that is, okay, yeah, that's it. So I, I put some names up here to um, for contact information on the various programs and also feel free to reach out to me. Great, thank um, you so much. Um, are there any questions about our in atmospheric science department? While I'm waiting for people to type in the chat, um, I will go ahead and ask 
what type of student do you think would do well in the atmospheric sciences department? So I, I think our strength is really our, our um, the connections between atmospheric sciences and the other disciplines. Um, we, I mean, we, we do, I think we're attractive to people that are very interested in hurricane modeling, but which is, you know, fairly focused. But I think if you're interested in, um, you know, the broader range of issues that atmospheric sciences is confronted with now with the, the changing climate, that Rosensteel School is an excellent place to come. Um, I, you know, I think our connections with colleagues in geosciences and marine biology and um, environmental policy just make, make this a very strong integrated program. Great. I have one more question in the chat. Um, for the weather forecasting NPS, it's been suggested that meteorology is a required undergraduate major. Is there consideration of other undergraduate programs such as mathematics or applied mathematics with a focus on atmospheric physics and oceanography? Oh, certainly, yeah. So for the weather <clears throat> for the weather forecasting track, we do require some basic math and uh, physical sciences in the back for in the undergraduate degree, um, computer science. But this is really evaluated on a one one on one basis by the track leader. So I'm not on top of exactly their requirements, um, but it's really part of a conversation. And it's no, you, you definitely don't need a um, undergrad meteorology per degree per se. In fact, it's perfect for people who are trying to get into the field because of this um, certification requirement for a lot of, or um, it's not necessarily a requirement always, but it's it's a strength. And this master's program also would leave you with that. Fantastic. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Dr. Zudema. Um, and if you all have any more questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat um, or you can reach out uh, to us. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now go ahead and talk about our Master of Professional Science program broadly. And I have the senior program coordinators for the program here, uh, Chelsea Begno and Kayla McIntree. All right, doing a little classic. Can everyone see my screen okay? All good. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the open house. My name is Kayla McIntyre. And I'm Chelsea Begno. And we're the senior program coordinators of the MPS, uh, the Master of Professional Science program, excuse me. Uh, Chelsea and I are also both alumni of the MPS program. So we're really happy to tell you more about the program. Um, but before we really get into it, we just wanted to kind of point out that you'll notice that our presentation is composed almost entirely of images. And these are real pictures of our actual MPS students and alum um, that were taken during field courses, travel courses, and during their internship work. Um, so if you look really closely, you can also spot Chelsea and I make a few appearances, including on this first slide. And if you look even closer, you can see Heidi make some appearances as well. Um, so the MPS program is designed to give students some hands-on experience in their field of choice. And I hope you have a clear idea of what that looks like at the end of this presentation. So the MPS degree is an accelerated professional science program that equips students with interdisciplinary knowledge, training, and real world experience to prepare for careers in our professional science job market. Our students can complete the degree in as few as 12 months, and they go on to work in various sectors like industry, government, and nonprofit organizations. We offer 14 unique tracks, as you heard Andrew say. Uh, some are as specialized as marine mammal science and broadcast meteorology, while others are as broad as marine conservation and climate and society. So each one of these tracks is managed by one or more track leaders from the Rosensteel faculty who are experts in that field of science. The suggested courses and plan of study that students follow for each of these tracks can be viewed on our MPS website under the degree tracks tab, which Heidi will drop in the chat. 
So our students typically complete two semesters of coursework before they transition into their internship phase. And there they can apply all that they've learned in their classes to an independent research project at a host organization of their choosing. The program offers a lot of flexibility when selecting an internship opportunity. Um, and this allows students to choose the location and the duration of their internship and also explore what specific interests they may have in their chosen realm of science. So as Kayla mentioned, we are both graduates of this program, so we can't leave without telling you the favorite parts of the program when we were students. So one of the things that I appreciated most about the program is the variety of classes that are available to students. So when I was in the program, this really allowed me to explore my interests and discover topics in science that I didn't know about previously. And some of the classes that I really enjoyed and gained a unique skill set from were citizen science, marine conservation outreach, and professional writing and science communication. Um, something else that I appreciate about the Rosenstiel School is the welcoming and fun atmosphere that we have and the wonderful network of connections in our community. And before we finish, I'm gonna also let you know about my favorite parts of the program. So what I really appreciated and what, draw, uh, what ultimately made me choose this, choose this program is that it was open to students of all backgrounds. So my undergraduate degrees are in public health and psychology, uh, but I was able to come into this program into the marine conservation track. And rather than being um, feeling behind, my background actually contributed to interesting class discussions and brought a different perspective to some of the different conservation issues that we were discussing. Um, and this was also true for students of all types of undergraduate experiences. We had people in our cohort and other friends who had humanities degrees, physical science degrees, language degrees, English, you name it. Everybody has different backgrounds here. Um, and I really liked that the program was so flexible to not only allow us to come in with these different backgrounds, but also you can sort of choose how you want to, where you want to focus your interests, the classes that you want to take, and um, specifically gear your education towards preparing you for the career that you want to pursue after you graduate. So as Andrew mentioned earlier, we are accepting applications for the MPS program at this time. So we hope that you'll consider the MPS program for your future graduate studies. Where uh, Kayla and I are also available to speak with any prospective students or currently admitted students. If there are any questions or concerns you may have about the program, we've included our email address and our Calendly links to schedule an appointment with us on the slide, but we'll also have it dropped in the chat. Thank you so much. And we hope that you'll join us next year. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you, Kayla. Um, are there any questions about the MPS program? We have a couple of minutes. Um, I have one here. Are MPS applicants automatically considered for merit-based waivers and the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award, or is it a separate application? I'm actually going to take this one myself. Um, you are automatically considered for merit-based waivers. You can learn more about the merit-based waivers on our site. Um, there's one option that's GPA only and another option. We don't require the GRE, but you're able to uh, submit GRE scores if your GPA is not high enough. And we can consider that for the merit-based tuition waiver, but it's optional. You do not have to do that. Um, for the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award, all you need to do is submit an application for the MPS before March 1st. Uh, and then we will automatically send you and separate application for the Rosenstiel Opportunity War Award in the first week of March. So um, you don't have to do anything other than submit your application. And if you've submitted your application before March 1st, then you'll automatically receive another application for the Rosenstiel Opportunity Award in March. Um, happy to answer other questions about that. Um, any last question for Chelsea and Kayla here? Um, let's see. Um, what kinds of jobs do MPS graduates land with the MPS degree? I'll take that one, Kayla. So um, in short, it depends. And the reason it depends is because we have a range of concentrations with the different tracks that students can choose and everyone has differing career interests. Um, so our program promotes interdisciplinary education. So our students are in a unique position to occupy a variety of positions in science. So we have some students that go on to be educators, work in communication, scientists, 
innovators. Uh, it really is a, a wide range. We have some students that work for federal and state organizations that support current conservation initiatives. We have others that are developing sustainable seafood and food security, uh, while others are helping develop environmental policies. So there really is a lot that students can do with their degrees and the skill set that they gain in the MPS program. Um, we've even had students graduate from the program and start their own organizations. So this is really something that you have the opportunity to share and discuss with your instructors, with your academic advisor, with us in the office, and we can help you get on the track to build that skill set, build that knowledge, and choose internships that will benefit you as you move into your career. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. And thank you so much for discussing the MPS program for us. And now for our final section of um, the various departments and programs, uh, we have back Dr. Kamenkovich talking about our undergraduate programs. Yes. Uh, hello again. Let me share my screen. Okay. Um, Okay, I will move very fast. Uh, I have a bunch of slides, but hopefully you'll get access to recording and you can look at the slides in more details. While the Rosenstiel uh, School, the undergraduate program at our uh, Rosenstiel School is one of the oldest and uh, best undergraduate schools in marine science, uh, programs marine science in, in the country. So the mission is combine, again, research and education and we emphasize uh, research-based education. Uh, these are some basic requirements um, uh, in addition to introductory level courses in biology, chemistry, geology, and other fields. Uh, students are also required to take core courses in other specific areas. And uh, the success of the program is the success of our students. And we are proud of uh, many numbers that happy to report. For example, 80% of our students participate in scientific research. And again, we emphasize research as a, one of the most important components of undergraduate education. Uh, approximately 40% of seniors uh, complete honors thesis, which is also uh, an achievement that we are proud of. And here's a list of examples of students uh, receiving awards and, um, and, 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 and other achievements. A quick look at different programs we offer. The first program is uh, I want to talk about the so-called double major program. So it's an interdisciplinary program that combines um, um, a degree in marine science, marine science major, with depth and requires second major. And here is a list of other second majors available, biology, chemistry, computer science, uh, geological science, math, and uh, and other fields. So this is probably the oldest program. It's, it was founded in 1977. Um, as, as, a, as a single major uh, programs uh, that I want to talk about, let's start from a program in geology. We offer Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts. The strong emphasis of that program is on field training. Of course, we are talking about geology and it, uh, it offers preparation for grad school and employment uh, and careers in several areas including environmental science petroleum or mining industry and research uh, marine affairs this program offers um, a bachelor of arts and it requires a minor in several fields you see the list on your screen anthropology economics ecosystem science and policy and so forth. And the program is designed for students to, uh, who wish to participate in graduate st studies, of course. Most of our gra graduates um, end up in a grad school, postgraduate education, um, but also prepares for the students for careers in marine policy, political ecology, marine resource economics, and so forth. Next degree I want to talk about, uh, marine biology and ecology. It's the largest undergraduate uh, program, undergraduate major in our school, extremely popular. And uh, the, the philosophy of this program is a reduced number of introductory courses and a strong emphasis on the upper level research intensive courses. So they require research experience, field work, work in the lab, and some uh, experience with independent learning, independent, uh, independent research. And it's a very flexible program. And again, it's the largest program at our school. 
Um, meteorology uh, is, uh, is a program that follows the curriculum of American Meteorological Society, requires a minor in mathematics, prepares for students, uh, for, again, for graduate school, and for also work in broadcast journalism, forecasting, uh, industry, government, and education. And uh, last but not least, uh, the single major in oceanography, it's basically a single major uh, marine science program. It's essentially a more flexible version of double major program. And also, it's also trying to provide students with uh, some kind of holistic view on the, on the marine science system. Uh, some additional programs that uh, serve students in all of these tracks, uh, students have a chance to participate on a cruise ship. So here is Walton Smith, actually freshman, I encourage to go on one of the cruises it's called Flotsam program. And many, many students apply and basically they spend the whole day at sea doing research, taking measurements from, um, uh, from the real research vessel. Uh, you Galapagos program is extremely popular. We're famous for this program. Basic, it's optional, but many, many students take the opportunity to spend the whole semester at uh, Galapagos, at this Bella Island. It's a full semester, 12 weeks, and unlike many other studies abroad program, in this program, the students uh, take courses from Rosenstiel faculty, right? So faculty will travel with the students and teach courses there at Galapagos, and all these courses will co uh, count toward their degrees, right? And Galapagos is a fantastic place to be, just your pictures from there. Right, uh, my marine biology and ecology department offers this new innovative learning program, so-called so salt water semester. Basically, students uh, spend a semester, well, take courses at the Rosenstiel campus, they don't have to live there. And the, all these courses are research intensive, upper level courses, and, and the focus is on hands-on experience, research, lab, and field experience. Again, very popular program and very successful. All right, uh, geology offers uh, several field trips and field programs, uh, we travel to this fantastic, some of them exotic places and learn more about geology. All right, and this is uh, last slide. Uh, classes is not everything, of course, important, but uh, students are also encouraged to join different clubs and organizations. And here's a list on this slide. All right, so uh, at this point, Presentation is over. I'm happy to answer your questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kamenkovich. Um, let's see what's coming in for questions about our undergraduate programs. But in the meantime, uh, I was wondering, what are the opportunities for undergraduate research in um, just generally in terms of like, what do undergrads do research wise? Um, they, uh, we strongly encourage all our undergraduate students to try research. You may not like it, but that will also important thing to know. Uh, but but you can uh, students can participate in research in different labs and uh, research groups at Rosenstiel. Right. When you do research at, um, at Rosenstiel, you will get so-called research credits. So your time doing research will count as an upper level elective course in marine science, for example. And there are multiple options depending, take a look at the list of faculty on our webpage. And most of these faculty will be happy to take a undergraduate students um, into their lab and they do. We have a whole list of students working in, in, in labs. And if you're successful at your research, if you're ready for it, you can end up as a senior thesis and graduate with honors provided that, providing that your GPA is high enough. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's probably about the amount of time we have right now, but, uh, if there are more questions about, oh, I guess, um, let's see, I'll answer those separately in the chat. Um, if you do have more questions about undergrad, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Kamenkovich for, um, covering, uh, two of our different things, both ocean sciences and undergraduate. And, um, now we will go ahead and... Yeah have our final presentation of the day before our Q&A. Uh, we will have one of our master's students, Remedy Rule, talking about our student organizations.
Hello. Hello, Emma. Um, do you, okay, let me pull up the PowerPoint. Sorry, I thought usually with these, they have the PowerPoints linked up. While Remedy is finding um, the PowerPoint, I'm just going to quickly answer one question live that we have, which is um, we had um, a question about if you're applying for the PhD program and you have reached out to advisors and one of the advisors has responded they're not taking new students, how does that affect your application? I would just say that if that's the case, you would probably want to talk about potentially make a list of other people you might be interested in working with and talk about working with those other people and reaching out to them in your application instead. Um, I see Remedy has a uh, visual now, so I will go ahead and drop, but. Okay, hi, sorry about that. Um, yeah, hi, I was a master's student. I graduated this summer and now I'm an employee at the university. So I've really enjoyed my time here. Wanted to stick around a little longer, but yeah, I'll briefly talk about the marine science graduate student organizations and the other organizations that are built out under this. Uh, so what does MSGSO do? So there's a mix of things that we do, um, enhance the student experience, fundraising for the student travel fund, design and sell rose and steel merchandise, uh, social and professional development events, and a multicultural and diversity events. So some of the social events we do, uh, recently we had our annual Halloween party and you can see some pictures. Um, I wanted to show off my coral tree costume. Uh, so everybody usually dresses in very like niche uh, marine science things. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, and we're having a holiday party coming up on December 1st. Um, we've also done a multicultural potluck where people brought food from uh, where they're from or maybe where their parents are from. Uh, and we also do beach cleanups as well as trivia nights. So actually tomorrow we have a trivia night uh, hosted by Waterlust. Um, what also MSGSO does merchandise. So we have a lot of merchandise with our school. Um, and yeah, if you're interested, yeah, I feel like our website is up. So, uh, and we usually try to do some new merch each year. Um, and sometimes the merch that's the previous year, you know, might be um, on sale. Uh, so yeah, if you guys are interested in either getting involved in merch or you want to get some merch, you can go through our website. The sustainability initiative, this is, uh, I was the co-chair of this. Um, and what we do here under MSGSO, the goal is to strengthen the intersection of science and sustainability by building environmental awareness and community through outreach activities and seminars. And we do a ton of different things. We have a garden, a community garden. Um, we've done a lot of stuff for Earth Week. We have lots of different recycling initiatives, plastic bags, electronics, textiles. Actually, the plastic bags we collect, um, we've won a bench. So that's what you see in this top uh, left corner. So that's a bench one from that's made from recycled plastics and reclaimed wood. Uh, yeah, we do beach cleanups. Um, and then here I can show this video. This is just... Um, um, Oops. Yeah, this is one that we had a clothing swap. We do plant swaps. We had a plant based meal demo. So lots of ways to get involved and, you know, just trying to make our uh, school more sustainable. You know, we learn about the importance in the environment. So we try to like match the lifestyle to um, all the things we know to be important about the environment. And we also do yoga, which is this semester. It's Thursdays. Um, so if you have an idea or want to get involved, you can email Aaron Wiseman, who is our current sustainability co-chair. Oops. Okay. Um, MSGSO also has a diversity, equity, and inclusion portion of Rose and Seal C's, Seco and Equity and Success. Um, so basically what these 
um, they do a lot of talks and it's supposed to be like a safe space. And I think they're about once a month and the topics can go from patriotism, nationalism there. It's usually like a little presentation and then it's like an open conversation to learn uh, and also be able to express um, your experiences. So um, it can be very powerful um, learning about this. And there also is a scholarship available that we've done uh, for a few semesters. So if you want to get involved um, or if you have an idea for an event, we did like a multicultural potluck uh, with um, C's. You can email Leith, who's the current multicultural chair. Uh, the auction is a huge thing that MSGSO does. So uh, it's super important for our student travel funds. So if you um, are going to a conference or something uh, related to your internship, you can apply to the student travel fund um, and you can win STF points by volunteering your time to the community. Um, but yeah, so it's super important to raise a lot of money, um, not only just for the student travel fund, but also like uh, the different events we host, like the Halloween party or the um, uh, the holiday party like it can be hosted like we'll have free drinks and food for students because of this auction so it's super important last year uh, we raised over eleven thousand dollars and so uh, yeah this is a huge volunteering event so if you guys are interested um, you can contact Sean um, but it's also a really like fun event seeing the different things that people are sharing um, and yeah if you want to auction off things or um, you can people also auction off services too excuse me so yes I'm just trying to go through this very quickly but um, if you're interested in getting involved with MSGSO these are just some of the people that are involved in MSGSO you know we have president positions treasury um, vice president um, the secretary like taking notes setting things up um, and then some committee chairs we have an events chair merch co-chair, multicultural chair, sustainability chair. So um, if any of this interests you, you know, we're always looking to fill positions as well as if you're like, oh, like I want to do an organization that like wasn't involved um, really with anything, like as much as you want to put in, uh, you can get out of it. So if you're like, oh, I want to start this on campus, um, you know, that can definitely be um, our community is open to um, new things. So yeah, that was pretty quick, but yeah, I, I can stick around for the question and answer um, if anybody wants to ask anything about MSGSO and the various organizations within it or any other kind of student orgs, but it's a really fun way to get involved, um, connect with the community and also feel like you're giving back to the community. Wonderful, thank you so much, Remedy. Um, and now we are at the final seven minutes of our uh, event, and that means we are open Q&A. Uh, we are lucky to still have Dr. Eberly and Dr. Kamakovich and Ariana Trapp and our MPS coordinators and Remedy here with us. Uh, I'm happy to address any other potential questions. Uh, if you have any questions now, please go ahead and type them in the Q&A and we will try to address them either live or in writing. Um, I will give it just a moment. I have one question with the marine biology course, be good for aspiring marine veterinarians. And I would say, yes, definitely. Um, the marine biology, courses can be good for that. It depends on what you're going into, but we certainly have a marine mammal science program and a very strong marine mammal science uh, master professional science program that has had people in the past who do a kind of marine veterinarian track. Any other questions? I have one about academic ac accommodations during undergrad, and if you're applying for the master's or PhD programs, would you submit documentation in the application, or should it be sent directly from the undergraduate university? I would say that when you're applying, you could probably just um, mention it if it's relevant to your application um, and to, uh, say, your undergraduate uh, record in some way, but if it's... Um, just an accommodation that you need, then you could probably address that after you have applied and been admitted. Um, any other questions? Andrew, I'll just, oh, yeah, I think Kayla and I are gonna Kelsey say the I, same thing. 
Yeah, we both <laughs> want to say the same thing, which is that once students are admitted, um, then you can submit your documents directly to the Office of Disability Services. Um, that said, these documents cannot come from your undergraduate institution to the office. They have to come directly from you or your medical provider to the Office of Disability Services. And Thanks. during any onboarding that we do for uh, verified students during the summer to prepare you for your um, undergraduate or graduate program, we do emphasize those deadlines for those documents to be submitted. Great. Uh, any other questions today? I am not seeing many. Um, I guess if we don't have more questions, I will wrap us up, but I would just like to close, first of all, by thanking all of our presenters and all of the folks who work behind the scenes to get this event going today. I'd like to thank all of you for participating, and I sincerely hope that you apply to either our graduate or undergraduate programs. And I would just like to once more emphasize that if you have any questions um, that are very specific to you, you can reach out to us, reach out to me, um, and you can schedule time with me for a virtual info session face-to-face -face on our website. I strongly recommend that you do this. Uh, if you are thinking of applying, because often it can be a very helpful process, and I have not talked to anyone who has joined one of those info sessions and come away saying that they felt worse about their application than they did going in. Um, so I would strongly recommend it. I think it is a really good thing. Um, there is one question about the Galapagos trip. Would I have to pay for tuition for the semester and for the trip or just the trip and not the tuition? I honestly don't know the answer to that for undergraduate. Do you happen to know, Igor? Uh, as, as far as I know, it includes regular tuition plus additional fee for going to Galapagos. Yes, that sounds right. Okay. And it's the same for graduate as well. Pay for tuition and for additional fees for the course. Great. Thank you. Any last questions? If not, uh, thank you all very much. We're done for today. I really appreciate your time and we hope that you will apply and that you will reach out with any questions that you have. Thank you to all of our presenters. Bye-bye. Thank you.